everyone and welcome to our Sunday service, old and new. And also welcome to those who are joining us from our auditorium this week. I hope you've been enjoying the hot weather we've been having lately and will enjoy the service also. I would now just like to say a short prayer. Dear God, thank you that our church is opening up for services again and please help us know how to best serve those who live in our community. Thank you. Amen. Hello. Some of you will be joining together in our church building this morning. What a joy. And even though many of us still cannot be joined together with you in this way, our hearts are joined together to worship God this morning. Let's take a moment just to be quiet, to put aside the busyness of the week, to bring to God our worries, our fears, and let's focus on him, our great God. And even though we may not be able to sing out loud at the moment, uh, we can lift our hearts to him in praise and worship and join with the angels singing, Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Feed thy tribute, bring ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like me his praise should sing? Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise the everlasting King. Praise him for his grace and same forever slow to chide and swift to bless praise him praise him praise him praise him glorious in his faithfulness father like he tends and spares us well our feeble frame he us, rescues us from all our foes. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, widely as His mercy flows. Angels help us to adore. He is here with each one of us now through his Holy Spirit to bring hopes to our fears, release to our anxieties, healing to our bodies and minds. Let him do that for you this morning. Jesus, what a powerful name. Now 
revealed in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name Throughout August, we'll be holding a service in the church again each Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to attend, you'll need to book your seat. And you can do this by calling the church office on 01243 375 606. If we're not in the office when you call, please leave a message to let us know your name, how many seats you'd like and for which date, and we'll book those seats in for you. You can also book using Church Suite. Just click on the date of the service that you'd like to attend and follow the booking instructions on the screen. From September we'll be holding two services every Sunday morning. Yep, you heard me right, two services. The first service will be called the 9 and will start at 9am and the second service will be called the 11 and will start at, yep, you guessed it, 11am. The clue is in the name. The two services will make it possible for everyone to meet safely with clear social distancing measures in place. Please note that due to the new government guidelines, face masks must be worn whilst in the church building. And there's more. If you don't feel like coming back to church just yet, or if you're shielding or vulnerable, you can still keep watching the service online. So there's something there for everyone. We're still open on Wednesday and Thursday mornings from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. for the food bank and for private prayer. It's been great to see a few familiar faces dropping in for prayer each week and we've missed having people around. Thank you also to all who volunteered to help 
the food that we're collecting each week is really helping people in our local community. So thanks to all of those volunteers. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much. Thank you for financially supporting Emsworth Baptist Church. Your tithes and offerings enable us to assist our church in discipleship and spiritual growth, to reach our community with the gospel message, and to support international missions work. There are three ways to give if you would like to. Firstly, by text. Text EBC Give with your chosen donation amount to 07 380 307 800. Secondly, by standing order to Emsworth Baptist Church. Our account number is 047 601 07 and our sort code is 52 4120. Thirdly, by check. Please post to the financial team at Emsworth Baptist Church, North Street, Emsworth, PO 10 7BY. Thank you. The Faithful Hall of Fame, Joseph. This is Joseph, hey. who was the son of Israel and Rachel. Ah. He was his father's favorite, so his brothers hated him oh. and sold him into slavery. Yeep. You see, Joseph was taken to Egypt, Ooh. and Potiphar, one of the Pharaoh's officials, bought him for his household. God was with Joseph, and he did well in Potiphar's house. Oh! Potiphar saw that God made everything Joseph did a success. Aha! So he put Joseph in charge of his whole house. Yeah! And God blessed Potiphar's house because of this. Potiphar's wife saw how well Joseph was doing in the house, and she wanted to make him do bad things. Joseph ran away from her because he wanted nothing to do with someone who would try to make him do the wrong thing. This made Potiphar's wife angry, and she wanted to be rid of Joseph. Huh? So she lied and made Potiphar believe that Joseph had done the bad things that she wanted him to do. Potiphar burned with anger against Joseph and sent him to prison. While Joseph was in prison, Again, he did well and the warden soon made him responsible for all that was done there. God was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh was having unsettling dreams. Pharaoh did not understand his dreams so he sent for Joseph. Hey. Pharaoh asked Joseph to tell him the meaning of his dreams. With God's help, Joseph told Pharaoh that the dreams told of what could come in the future and he explained all the dreams to the Pharaoh. Pharaoh believed that what Joseph was saying was true. He trusted Joseph as a wise man. And he put him in charge of the land of Egypt, of Pharaoh's palace and of all his people. morning everybody. I'm doing a book review and I'm doing two for the price of one this morning. I'm doing a wonderful book which is fairly new on the shelves and it's just come out. It's by John Mark Comer, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry 
and it's a direct quote from Dallas Willard, who a lot of you will know, and it talks about slowing down, having time to think and ruthlessly change your ways for your soul. And it's the most wonderful book that everyone should have on their bookshelves. And uh, I know it's changed an awful lot of people's lives, including John Mark Comer. It's a wonderful book. Now for my second book, which is one of the top sellers in the UK at the moment. It's a hardback book. It's not cheap, but it's for all ages. And it's the most beautiful, beautiful story of four animals, the boy, the mole, the fox and the horse by Charles Mackesy. Charles Mackesy goes to Nicky Gumbel's church and it's full of God and love and Jesus but it, they're never mentioned and it's the most beautifully illustrated book. It's all about sharing your love and your emotions with safe people and growing in friendships and kindness for one another and it's just full of the most sweet sweet drawings and kindness and little mole loves his cake and every single page has got the most beautiful illustrative drawings and uh, I know a lot of people have read it and it's brought tears to their eyes. It is a beautiful book. They're on a journey and they talk about their emotions and I really can't recommend it highly enough. We join with the heavenly host and all creation to sing God's praise together and we open our hearts to him to receive his word through Joel and the message he brings to us this morning. Praise him, you heavens and all that's above. Praise him, you angels and heavenly hosts. Let the whole praise him. Praise him, the sun, moon, and Shining stars, praise him, you heavens and waters and skies. Let the whole praise him. Great in power, great in glory, great in mercy, King of heaven.
Well, good morning and uh, thank you for joining us today as we continue our series entitled Seven. And a special word of welcome to those who are meeting in our auditorium for our in-person service which began today. And I particularly want to welcome those who are visiting Emsworth and have joined us this morning for our service. Welcome. Good to have you with us. Now, last week we began a new series of messages entitled Seven, as we looked at the seven letters sent to the churches that we read about in the New Testament book of Revelation from chapters 2 to chapter 4. And we started the series by looking at the letter which was sent to the church in Ephesus, uh, where the Lord, um, yes, commends the church for the much that they do, but also warns them and tells them to return to their first love. Well, let's continue this morning as we look at the second letter which was sent to the church in Smyrna. And so we're going to read the passage, Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, and we are reading from the New Living Translation. Write this to the angel of the church in Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who was dead but is now alive. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not, because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for ten days. But if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. The city of Smyrna was a very interesting city, and it gives us some clues as to the background of the letter written to this church. Firstly, Smyrna was a very refined city. It was one of the most beautiful cities of the ancient world. Um, it was a free city, and uh, that meant it, it had its own government. It did not have to pay taxes or tribute to the Roman Empire. The city had been built and designed by Alexander the Great. It was, in that day, really a model city. The streets were wide, spacious, all of them well paved. They ran in perfect right angles uh, from each other, from one side of the city to the other. In fact, there was one street that was so famous that it became known as the Golden Street. It began at the harbour and ran all the way through the city uh, until the very northern part of the city. And it was lined with various temples dedicated to the many gods of that day. So on one side there will be a temple to the goddess Sibyl, um, on the other side there will be a temple to Apollo, next to it there will be a temple to Scalapius, the god of healing, and then of course the beautiful temple to the goddess Aphrodite, and the street wind its way up to the city until it ended at the temple of the Greek god Zeus, was also the Latin god um, Jupiter. And next to this temple was a theatre, which at the time was the largest theatre in the world, sitting more than 35,000 people. Now Smyrna was also a very rich city. It was a seaport and its harbour was one of the best in the world at that time. It was one of the few harbours that we know of, of, of that day that could be entirely closed off in times of war. And this was important because in times of war, ships could still continue to come and unload um, their cargo without fear of being sunk. So, whether by sea or by road, Smyrna was a center of commerce. And even today, the city, uh, which is known as Eshmi in modern Turkey, is a very wealthy and pros prosperous city of almost 300,000 people. It's also important to note that Smyrna was a very religious city. 
apart from all the other gods that were worshipped there, this city was also the center of Caesar worship. And in Smyrna, you literally had your pick of religions and your choice of gods. Um, and in the city, we find a Christian church that receives a letter from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a letter that shows that God was so pleased with them. Of the seven churches in Revelation, this is the only one of two churches that receives no criticism from the Lord Jesus Christ. But this does not mean that these Christians had an easy life. In fact, it was just opposite as we look at it. You see, so let's look at some of the problems of the church. Although this was a church that loved the Lord, that loved the work of God, that was faithful to God, uh, one of the seven churches, Smyrna was probably the one church that had the most problems. And let me share some of those problems with you this morning. To start with, there was the problem of persecution. If you have your Bibles with you and you look at verse 9, Jesus says, I know your troubles. Jesus saw their troubles. The original word literally means to be pressurized or to be crushed. It referred to the execution of a man who was killed by having a heavy rock placed on top of him. The weight of the rock would gradually crush this man to death. And this is the type of pressure that the church was experiencing. It's also important to note, to understand, that the word here does not refer to ordinary, common, everyday suffering, but specifically suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ. Why were these Christians in Smyrna suffering from the Lord? Well, as I've just said, uh, Smyrna was a pagan city. Every god had its own particular temple. And if Christians had been willing to take Jesus and put him alongside all the other gods and build a temple for him, well, that would be fine. If they were willing to make Jesus one of the many, they would have had no problems. But the Christians in Smyrna refused to do that. They would not put Jesus with any other gods. And so that created a problem for them. But that was not the major problem. You see, the major problem was that Smyrna was the center of Caesar worship in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Now, with every other god, you enjoyed religious freedom. You could choose to worship Diana or you could choose not to worship Diana. You could choose to worship Mercury or choose not to. But everyone had to worship Caesar. Everyone had to proclaim that Caesar was Lord. And in a way, this was a very simple thing to do. Once a year, you simply had to come to the temple of the emperor, burn some incense and say two words, Caesar's Lord. If these Smyrna Christians had just been willing to do this little thing, they would have been accepted throughout the city. But these Christians, when forced to come to the temple, would stand there and say, No, we will not say, Caesar is Lord. We can only say, Christ is Lord. And no matter what people try to do to these Christians, they would not utter the words, Caesar is Lord. And so persecution became something that they had to live with every day. But persecution wasn't their only problem. They also had to deal with the problem of poverty. Again, look at verse 9, the words of Jesus. I know your troubles and that you are poor. Now, there are two words in Greek, in the Greek language, for the English word poor. One word means to barely make it. But this is not the word that's used in this verse. The word used in this verse means absolute and utter destitution. It means to have absolutely nothing. In such a rich, well-to-do city, why was this church so poor? Well, the reason is simple. The economic life of Smyrna was built around the various gods and goddesses. And to be able to work, 
people needed to be part of a trade union and every trade union had a certain patron god or goddess that would be worshipped. So if you trusted Jesus Christ as your saviour and remain loyal to him, you could not find work. You literally had to live from hand to mouth. These Smyrnan Christians had accepted that even if it was bad for business, even if it meant they could not buy or sell, they would not compromise their faith in God. No wonder Jesus had no word of criticism for this church. Persecution, poverty, and then the problem of slander. In verse 9, Jesus continues to say, I know the bad things some people say about you. They say they are Jews, but they are not true Jews. They are a synagogue that belongs to Satan. It's quite an interesting verse. And let's remember that these are words that are spoken by Jesus himself. It seems that there were some people who kept on slandering these Christians. Now, Leonard Ravenhill was an amazing Christian writer with a very clear prophetic ministry once said this, when God opens the windows of heaven to bless, to bless you, the devil will open the doors of hell to bless you. And that's what the Christians in Smyrna had come to experience. And if persecution, poverty and slander were not enough, this church had another problem to contend with. And that was the problem of prison. Jesus says in verse 10, Do not be afraid about what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer for ten days. Life for these Christians was not easy. Not only did they have to face persecution and poverty and slander, there was the real possibility that they would end up in prison. And this meant that not only would they lose their freedom and experience the horrors of ancient prisons, it also meant that their families would suffer. For some of them, in fact for many of them, the person going to prison would be the only one in the family who could scrape a bit of money to survive. And that's what you had signed for when you became a member of this church. I wonder how many of us will be prepared to sign up for membership in this church. But you know something? In spite of all the negatives, this church has something that so many churches struggle to obtain. What is it? In the words of Jesus, they were rich. But what do I mean by that? Well, the answer brings me to my second point, the prosperity of the church. Again, looking at verse 9 and the words of Jesus, I know your troubles and that you are poor, but really you are rich. On the outside, they may have appeared poor, but spiritually they were truly rich. Jesus said Smyrna was a rich church. How were they rich? Well, they were rich in the ways that any church can be rich today. They were rich in worship. They were an exciting church. They were happy and joyful in Jesus. They were giving Jesus their best. They were a church of conviction, not of compromise. They were a church of loyalty, not of luxury. They were a church of commitment, not convenience. And their suffering did not make them bitter. It made them better Christians. They were also rich in works. They were working and ministering for the Lord Jesus Christ. Out of their poverty, they were sharing with those that were even poorer than they were. And then they were rich in witnessing. Just think about the, the testimony and the witness that they had for God. Here they were. The door met as if it were of the city, yet they just kept on shining for God. They would tell anyone was listening to them that Jesus saves, that Jesus had changed their lives. Jesus had conducted a spiritual audit of this church and he said, You are rich. 
you are in good shape. And so he ends the letter with a promise to this church. And that's the third point that we take from this passage, the promise to the church. And Jesus' promise is directly related to the suffering of this church. Jesus knew the suffering of this church. He knew the trouble. He knew what the church was going through. And so he includes three points, three facets in this promise. The reason for suffering. Although we may not always understand it, sometimes there is a reason and a purpose for suffering. In this case, Jesus said from verse 10, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. While Satan tempts us into in order to destroy, God will allow testing to develop us. The word literally means to refine. It means to separate the dross from the gold. It means to mature and to develop a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. So let's remember, sometimes there is a reason for our suffering. It is for the testing of our faith. But let's also realize that there is a limit to the suffering. Again, in verse 10, we read, do not be afraid of what we are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer for 10 days. Now, in this verse, we have the symbolic use of numbers. Why is it that this tribulation will only last 10 days? Well, the number 10 is one of those numbers that represents human completeness. So the point that Jesus is making here is that there is a limit to the suffering of God's people. You will only suffer, Jesus says, for 10 days, not for 10 little days, but for a certain period of time, the perfect time. This tells us that God has absolute sovereign power over suffering that is in full control. The Bible makes it very clear that God will never allow us to suffer beyond that which we can bear. If the breaking point were ever to come, Jesus would cut off the suffering. And finally, the reward of suffering. Now, Jesus sent this letter to the angel of the church in Smyrna, as we read in verse 8. The word angel literally means messenger, and it refers to the pastor of the church. And the pastor of the church at Smyrna was a man by the name of Polycarp. He was a contemporary of the Apostle John. When he was 86 years old, he was brought before the emperor uh, for the purpose of worshipping Caesar and denying Jesus Christ as Lord. The emperor said to Polycarp, All you have to do is to say, Caesar is Lord, to deny Christ, and you have your freedom. And you can just about imagine the multitudes looking at this man, and every member of the church in Smyrna watching and wondering, what will their pastor say and do? And Polycarp looked at the emperor and he replied, Eighty and six years, I have served him, and he has never wronged me. How can I then blaspheme the king who has saved me? And the people were so incensed with Polycarp's reply that they gathered wood for a fire so they could burn him at the stake. And they came to him with chains and ropes to bind him to the pole, and he said to them, You don't need those things. You do not need to tie me to the pole. My God will protect me and enable me to go through the fire. In verse 10, we read the words of Jesus. But be faithful, even if you have to die, and I'll give you the crown of life. I'm glad that Jesus said, be faithful instead of be successful. If he had said, be successful, and I'll give you a crown of life, maybe many of us would not have a crown. If he had said, be brilliant, many of us would not be smart enough to obtain a crown. If he had said, be wealthy, many of us would be too poor to obtain a crown. But he said, be faithful, and I'll give you the crown of life. 
Now, in our country, we are not persecuted for our faith. We do not face poverty or the prospect of prison because of our faith. But nevertheless, there is a call upon us not to compromise on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And what we learn from this church is that we need to remain faithful to Christ, no matter what the situation may be. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, we read that Jesus is the faithful witness. And what the Lord is saying was, You be faithful to me, because you can rest assured that I will be faithful to you. Amen. We're now coming to the end of our service for this week. It's been great to have you here with us, and we hope that you'll come back again next week and join us then. Don't forget that if you'd like to attend any of our services in person, you'll need to book your seats. Let's just finish with a word of prayer. Let the peace that surpasses all understanding be with us all as we finish our time of worship here today. Whether we're watching at home or whether we're sitting with others in our church building, help us to make a difference in the world this new week. Let our words and actions align with your word. Help us to practice what we've learned here today. Bless us as we head into a new week and help us to be a blessing to everyone that we meet and interact with. Help us never to forget that you're with us always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you all next week. Bye-bye.